Hi, um, welcome to Actual Spinster. My name is Anna Marie, and today I have a guest. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Vicky, and I am today's guest. Yeah, you have actually been on my channel before. I have. So if you've been watching, you know, one of my loyal fans you might recognize Vicky. But yeah, we, we're uh, spending time together, and so I thought I would make Vicky make a video with me. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I decided to kind of talk about like revolutionary feminist, I guess like books and films specifically that like engage in some way with like revolutionary feminist struggle, like as a means of kind of sort of like maybe broadening some of the conversations happening around maybe like, like f Palestinian freedom and approaches to like, you know, revolutionary change but also just like as a general conversation because obviously militant feminist struggle is always relevant under always. capitalist patriarchy and like you know the global systems of domination that we all live under in various degrees is there anything else you want to tell us about yourself before we start so i'm very clever <laughs> <laughs> everything i say i should have known you were going to say something like that. <laughs> is correct <laughs> yes so it's really good that I'm here <laughs> to help make this video. I was actually trying to look for revolutionary feminist texts from groups based in the UK in like a women's library archive oh, yeah. recently and couldn't really find anything at all. Mm. And I think a lot of these also, they may not say the word, yeah. but are more just in spirit, like maybe anti-capitalist, maybe linking the patriarchy with like anti-colonialism, yeah. which it's not really possible to disentangle them, but other kinds of feminism may try to. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's kind of the thinking behind this list. Yeah, and I guess kind of like as a, as an antidote to yeah, like you said, sort of like the liberalization of what is a genuinely radical concept like feminism, women's freedom the the sort of end of all violence and all chains uh, chains of oppression like before we go on i do want to say that this isn't like a particularly like cohesive list or like it's not a very like strategic list in the sense of like it's got all of the areas of the world covered or it's got you know it's just kind of things i've read or watched and things we yes. have that uh fit but there's always like gaps and there's loads of stuff that i want to read that i do think fits into this but i kind of wanted to talk about things that i've already you know that we've already like experienced obviously if you have any recommendations i would love to hear them so yes please let me know in the Type comments in the, below in the comments. Yeah, in the... <laughs> subscribe oh okay <laughs> if you haven't already oh, and then think... comment oh. <laughs> comment that you have or haven't subscribed depending on whether you have or haven't <laughs> and then say my recommendation is yeah or your list is perfect. Oh, yeah. It's got everything and covered. And Vicky is clever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that doesn't... I don't want you to do it just because I said it, you know. <laughs> just, only if you, if you believe that. <laughs> if you don't, don't tell me. <laughs> don't tell me. I may go very fragile. Yeah, well, on that note, <laughs> I think we should begin. So I think first we'll talk about some films and then about books. The first film is actually one that we saw together quite a few years ago now, I guess. Um, and it, I think it is kind of like famous, um, maybe in some circles as opposed to others, I guess, but like it's called Born in Flames and it was directed by Lizzie Borden um, from 1983. Um, but basically it's it's just really cool. It, it It's set in the future in New York, I think, um, where they have like um, started like a social democratic state. But then it's sort of about like how women are still treated and and these women like organize to try to kind of make it more utopian and more feminist um and they create like a women's army and stuff and then it sort of also revolves i think around like the death of one particular activist and they're trying to figure out like what happened to her um yeah i just remember it being really really cool and like sort of vibrating with how like the energy of it and you know I, there's lots of language i think that we wouldn't use if you like remade the film today because it is from the 80s um but at the same time like the core like its heart feels very like just mm. like very similar to like the kinds of like conversations and the kinds of desires that we want today in a in a like yes. left feminist movement and um yeah i yeah it's coming back to me now is it good? Yes, okay. yes i remember yeah. really enjoying it yeah and i think it was one of those films that's 
like if you do organizing of some form or have been some kind of leftist circles you're like oh yeah this does happen but i do remember <laughs> the feeling which after all is sometimes the most, most important, important thing, thing. Yes, <laughs> true. um which was like felt very relatable and also kind of hopeful yeah. um in the maybe slightly double-edged way that uh -huh. those kind of films are that yeah. are from a long time ago but you still relate to them yeah and then you're like oh we're still dealing with the same issues but also people envisioned the same things I envisioned then and it may not like have come to fruition now mm -hmm. but also like there are solutions to yeah. those problems and there are people dedicated enough to yeah. make like really freaky films <laughs> I, I remember that I really wanted to make like uh, badges that said like women's army because that's, that's what they like create. Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> Instant regret having me on this video. I'm going to mention two films, but one of them I'm actually just going to say once because uh, Vicky hasn't seen either of these. Um, but one of them is also kind of hard to uh, access, I think, probably because like the only reason I got to see it was because it was like part of like a sort of dyke films from the 90s showcase, um, like online. <sighs> But it's great. It's called Your Mother Wears Combat Boots, Dyke Mum Rants by Laurel Swenson, mm -hmm. 1996, which is a great title. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a great film. It's a short film. And yeah, it's like interviews with a bunch of like dyke mums, most of whom are like working class and talking about like the struggle of being a dyke and a mum, but also like, yeah, how great children are too. And like what raising kids is like. It's a great, it's a great film. Um, but the other film is Criminal Queers. I actually think I have probably spoken about this film before because again, I watched this quite a while ago, which was directed by Chris Vargas and Eric Stanley and it's from 2009. It actually has Angela Davis like in it, like a little bit. She agreed to be part of it. Ooh, playing yeah. herself. Yeah. Or a character. Playing okay. herself, yeah. <laughs> it's a great film about prison abolition and it's basically, it's kind of like a, it's like a trans feminist prison break. Ooh. Yeah. It's just really fun and it's very like camp and queer and it's also quite like lo-fi and like uh, like low budget and stuff but it has a great heart and I really enjoyed it so I definitely recommend that. Um, what time do you call this then? <laughs> <laughs> well now I think we will talk about books um, in general. This book we have both read and we both loved. <laughs> and that's Wayward Lives Beautiful Experiments uh, by Sadia Hartman. I read it recently um i really loved it i feel like it, there's a lot in it yeah there is a lot in it like it's and it's a very intense book i think in terms of how like it really deals with like like history history that is violent or like the violence of like the moment in history um but i guess its main focus kind of is on well i kind of want to say it's on queer women but i don't think that's totally accurate but it is on gender outlaws are like yeah i feel like that's maybe a term used but it's specifically focused on like black women, black queer people, you know, I think some of the people included in this probably wouldn't necessarily be identified as women today, but I also sort of feel like that's sort of the point in the sense that this is also like a critique of, or like it's aware of the way that like black women are uh, gendered differently through their racialization and sort of vice versa and how then being queer on top of that also kind of like you know there's like a very particular like material experience because of that and this is also it's it's a history from the 20th century um and i think it focuses on like new york and philadelphia i feel like those are the main cities and then yeah it, it's just like this really fantastic kind of i don't know i always like to think of it as like a seance because it's it feels very like alive with the voices of these people who have been erased and forgotten both in terms of like literally they are quite hard to like recover but also in the sense that like political history doesn't think that they're important enough it doesn't think that their behaviors are even political or revolutionary and this is kind of like a, a testament to the fact that no they are uh the way that a lot of these women were like living their lives and creating themselves was a deeply radical act of resistance and of like anarchic joy and, and anarcho-feminism but yeah i don't know if that's like a good sum but it's kind of hard as a book to like sum summarize because it does feel yeah. like so big i don't know it's very unique and i think I, what i like was also the style mm. it was quite um a way into the book that i realized that there were basically these like italicized bits um that you could go at the end of the 
of the book and I think they're called voices from the chorus uh -huh. mm -hmm. I think she talks about like that period is also like a revolution of everyday life and yeah. revolution in relationships yeah. and that's a very feminist yeah. um, point of view yeah. uh, on what even constitutes like revolutionary behavior yeah, yeah it's quite a dense book to read yeah, I think because it, of that yeah. but you can read it in many different ways at many different levels I think yeah. like, but I got a lot out of it not just from like the writing but then everything that all the sources yeah. and it does bring into life definitely so i think it's yeah a really great way to write history as well i agree and, and it's I, very queer it is very queer the next like one is kind of like a person i guess or yeah but like that's audrey lord and we've both read different things from her but it was a while ago that i read um, a collection of essays yeah. sister outsider which has that great essay about like the use of anger, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, and also the master's tools uh, will never the classic one. The yeah, master's yeah. house. I wanted to include her on this list because I do feel like she's part of what we're talking about and like revolutionary feminist struggle and like, but um, I don't actually feel like I know her work that well partially because I haven't read it for ages. But you know, I did read Zami a new spelling of my name, which which is her, like I think she calls it a biomythography of her life. Um, yeah, and uh, that was great too. It's about her life, but it's also, you know, obviously you can't tell your life without talking about like the social, uh, political, <laughs> and yeah. yeah, like landscape that created it too, but yeah. So the next book we would like to talk about is this one. Uh, it's called Sarah, My Whole Life Was a Struggle. It's an autobiography uh, from Sarah, who was one of the co-founders of the PKK and organized within the Kurdish freedom movement and specifically the Kurdish women's movement part of that extensively until she died in uh, Paris in 2013. She was assassinated, right? Yes. There's another yeah. volume of this that's, I think, her memoirs from prison. And this oh, I is... that was... Oh, I see. No. It was the beginning of her life. This is... Her, yeah. Yeah. Her early years, um, like right from childhood, and then her kind of getting involved in the Kurdish women movement and starting to organize, and she left her hometown to become a revolutionary. So I read most of this by now, and I got a lot out of it. It is written in quite an ordinary way, in the sense that it's it's very much like, on this day I did this, uh -huh. <laughs> you know? And it's not political, because her whole life was political, yeah. I think, even more so than most people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was dedicated, she was committed. Yeah. But also, I think she wrote it while doing a billion other things. Like, she didn't set time aside just to write a book. She right. couldn't have done that, really, because right. she was so active. So it's, like, a little bit scattered at some point, like, a lot of details, at some point not. But I think I found that really good about it. Because, again, it's, like, her day-to-day -day life, her relationships, the, like, pressure to be married, the relationship with her family. <laughs> like, just a lot of um, information that you couldn't really get otherwise. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah. I think it's a really good way to learn about the women of the Kurdish militant struggle alongside books like the Kurdish Women's Movement, which came out recently, which is non-fiction, mm -hmm. which I also read. Well, yeah, this is non-fiction. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, kind of maybe a bit more academic, but mm -hmm. still very, very accessible um, in terms of the way it's written, but definitely like more of like an in-depth overview of the whole movement, the history, etc. It's really good. So the next book is Experiments in Imagining Otherwise uh, by Lola Olifemi, um, which is, I feel like it's pretty different than a lot of the books, although at the same time, but also it, I do feel like it fits on this list to some degree. Like, yeah, I mean, this book is kind of hard to describe because as the well, title an, would suggest, yeah. it's an experiment <laughs> and it like plays around, but it's not just like one experiment. This has lots of different like, parts to it and like explorations of various things there's some stuff about like uh photographs and like political moments there's definitely some historical kind of also archival yeah usage yeah. in there definitely and a lot of it i would say i guess is poetry or poetic to some degree yeah, yeah i don't know I, I i really liked it i i didn't love it as much as i thought i would but i do think that it like does a lot of like thoughtful work around like what feminism is and like what trying to struggle for a better future kind of like feels like yeah it's very good anything else to say if you're in the uk then this might resonate yeah. with you like 
especially well. I haven't read. I did it get yet. that far. Okay. <laughs> but I uh, yeah I I have read it. It's so nice. It's very nice uh, graphics and also pictures and it's also written in a really really like down to earth easy to read way. And it's only seven pounds. <laughs> yes, it's called <laughs> Worth Fighting For, Bringing the Rojava Revolution Home by Ginny Kizan and Natalia Sarek. And um, it's basically an account of two women who went to Rojava for a few years and then came back and are talking about the experience of um, volunteering there and putting into the context of also feminism in the UK and their experiences with other kinds of organizing. But I think it's um, like, this is a thread in all these books, but it's very good in the sense that it shows how emotions and like the whole of life is bound up mm -hmm. with the revolutionary path and also humanizes a lot of these issues without necessarily being like too subjective. Like there's a lot of information to be found about the struggle mm -hmm. and about people they've interacted with and organized with. But there's also that element of, yeah, I guess lived experience, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, Ooh. it's a really beautiful book I recommend. It made me cry many times, mm -hmm. but then again, most of these did. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. A new list, feminist books that made me cry. <laughs> Every single one, no. <laughs> A book that I have mentioned before uh, quite a lot because I really do love it, but I did think that it still fits in this list, although it is, I guess, a bit like Wayward Lives, it's like very historical and also has like a interesting methodology about how it is like uncovering and telling history, but is the book The Fury Archives by Juno Jill Richards. Basically, I guess the reason why I wanted to include it on this list is because it talks about some stuff around like the Paris Commune in the 1870s or so and about like the women who were involved in that and like how they were involved and also how they were like criminalized after that and practices of dealing with an archive of incarceration or like incarcerated people which I do feel like is a really fundamental part of I mean revolution generally but especially like revolutionary feminist struggle because yeah I don't know I guess like I feel like prison and incarceration those are like that's like a key part of what structures people's lives even if they're not in prison you know they also talked about um, some like anti-colonial riots as well uh, i think in martinique it was a while since i read this as well and that was also sort of i thought that was like really interesting as like a global kind of connection between paris commune stuff and anti-colonial struggle which i feel like it's often easy to look back at these like uh big left-wing moments and just think about like white people and their involvement as opposed to like either how they were transformative globally or how people were setting up links like internationalist links yeah um and more than just between like european countries so the next book is revolutionary letters by diane de primo uh, which is a collection of uh, like poems i would call them yeah we've both read this and liked it very I much it. yeah i mean i guess some poems were like it's all poetry's like but some of these poems are just so beautiful we can read a poem. Yeah. Should we read a yeah. poem? Yeah, no, we have plenty of time in this video. So, Revolutionary Letter 22. <laughs> what do you want your kids to learn? Do you care if they know factoring, chemical formula, theory of numbers, equations, philosophy, semantics, symbolic logic, Latin, history, so-called, which is merely history of mind of Western man, least interesting of numberless manifestations on this planet? Do you care if he learns to eat off the woods, to set a broken arm, to mend his own clothes, cook simple food, deliver a calf or baby? If there are cars, should he not be able to keep his running? How will he learn these things? Will he learn them cut off in a plaster box, encased in a larger cement box called school, dealing with paper from morning till night, grinding no clay or mortar, no pigment, setting no seedlings in black earth, Come spring, how will he know to trap a rabbit, build a raft, to navigate by stars, or find safe ground to sleep on? What is he doing all his learning years inside, as if the planet were no more than a vehicle for carrying our plastic constructs around the sun? <laughs> she has a point. She does. Now we'll talk about uh, Angela Davis, icon. Icon, yeah. And specifically her book, Woman, Race, and Class, which I read over the last year. I still haven't read it. And I highly, 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 highly recommend. I think it offers like a good overview of various parts of like black feminist history. Mm -hmm. 
in the US. It goes like all the way to like anti-slavery, uh -huh. emancipation. Uh, like a, oh, right, yeah. And also talks about like more contemporary stuff to her time. My favorite chapter is one that's called Communist Woman. Ooh, okay. Where she talks about the uh, Women's House of Detention in New York. Oh, okay. Nice. And um, like her experience being a prisoner there, I think. Or maybe just quotes people that are written about their experience. And there's some really beautiful, I think, letters quoted in there from a woman in the prison. Um, and also Communist Woman, hot. <laughs> so note that down. <laughs> yeah, I really got a lot of that book. Nice. Like one of my favorite books like obviously this book is on my like to read list slash i feel like i've probably read like the introduction like three times and then been like i'm too tired and put it back in the library yeah you know? and i think this one really really is about revolutionary feminism uh -huh. because even when she talks about um like all of the racism coming from the suffragette movement for right, example yeah, yeah. she also talks about some white women, I think specifically from like the trade unionist movement and like working class women who stood in solidarity with right. the like you know anti slavery yeah. activists as well. And I think kind of just yeah, puts forward like a radical version of history that's like there were always there always have been people that have stood on the right side, yeah, yeah. and just because like maybe you're white and a feminist doesn't mean you have to embrace white feminism right. like, there are examples in history of yeah. people that have been anti-racist actively anyway um so another book that we're including on this list is the dialectic of sex the case for a feminist revolution by shulamit firestone infamous <laughs> infamous feminist from the 70s she was a uh, part of uh, setting up some radical feminist groups in the us at the time and so you haven't read this yet, but we read some of it together. Yes, that's right. You read some of it to me. Actually, yes. we, yeah, we took turns reading it out loud. Yeah, in a feminist uh, consciousness yeah, raising circle. Raising. <laughs> consciousness raising of her problematicness as yes. well. I mean, firstly, it's definitely revolutionary feminism in a way that's also like self-aware uh -huh. of that label, okay. which is quite rare. And I think that's one of the things I like about her. And it's like... So she wrote it wanting it to be the like um the sec like the second sex by Simone de Beauvoir, right, like yeah. just as famous, just as important. And then it wasn't and it was kind of maybe not received so well. But I think like she just she talks a lot about things like family abolition mm. and relationships, emotions, yeah. how the patriarchy how like sexuality. Yeah, and marriage as well. And how women are conditioned by culture to behave like sort of way or maybe want to like copy the way that men go about relationships mm -hmm. and thinking that's liberation mm -hmm. she was quite critical of like the idea that sexual revolution had happened in the 70s that liberated women yeah. anyway i think it's just like a very daring book yeah. like even if she gets a lot of things wrong yeah. and there's also like i think a specific chapter that's quite racist yeah, yeah. um there are other points specifically in chapters about emotions and, and romance love. yeah yeah, and, and like the cultural scripts around love and romantic love um, that are, I guess, just like quite radical. Yeah. The bits that we read, so we read chapter six, which is like about love, and it's sort of like the famous chapter of it. I don't know. Maybe it's not, but like. Well, I think the last chapter is also quite <laughs> right. famous because it's the one where she details, like, I think her whole vision for oh, a revolution. Yes, yes that's right. Yeah. And she's just like, this is what we need to do. Yeah. And it's very. I don't know, in some ways it's also sci-fi. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I do feel like her work is really challenging, both for today and also, obviously, when it was first released. But that's also why she's interesting to kind of re-engage with, I guess. And obviously people, I think, are kind of shining more light on her now, especially yeah. because family abolition is having a moment. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I, she doesn't use the term family abolition, does she? She's But she's talking about, like, the mechanism no, of the family. but she's talking about also, like, children, liberation. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And the nuclear family in terms of heterosexuality. Yeah. But she's also a Marxist. Yeah. So I think... Dialectics in the, in the name. Yeah. I know <laughs> what that means. <laughs> you couldn't tell. <laughs> if you want somebody to know you're a Marxist, just say dialectic. Oh, it's the dialectic of breakfast. <laughs> it's the dialectic of revolutionary feminism. Ooh, what would that be? <laughs> I say revolutionary, you say feminism, okay, you can... and then we synthesize. Oh, okay. You're not going to say 
revolutionary. Feminism. Revolutionary. Feminism. <laughs> Perfect. Good. The next thing is, like I said, another fiction book and also a science fiction book. And I definitely feel like it fits pretty well coming after the dialectic of sex because it sort of like fictionalizes stuff that is being explored by Sheila Ruth Firestone. But yeah, so this is Woman on the Edge of Time by Marge Piercy, which is like a 70s sci-fi feminist classic. And it is a really incredible book. It's basically about a woman who, um, gets institutionalized in like a psychiatric um, hospital and previous to that and also during her time at the hospital um, she finds she can uh, travel forward in time um, and she like builds this connection with somebody that she meets in like in the future and so through that connection we learn you know we kind of see like a radical vision of what the future could be like and how things could be different um, in terms of like people's interpersonal relationships into mass like it's a massively family abolitionist book um, because it is really exploring like when you get rid of patriarchal ties like what happens they use like different pronouns I think it's like per and pass or something like person um, something like that um, yeah and, like, you know this again it's like some of these things it's like the little olive family like experimental thing where like some things you're gonna be like yeah this is great and some things you're like okay <laughs> like you know I loved it's a great book um and yeah so so uh that would be another thing like, it is a fiction book and it is like very heavily about like psychiatric violence and like it's you know again it's it's seeing that as an incarceration like a state of incarceration and control so that can be really difficult but I also feel like it's a very like hopeful and like um or I don't know if hopeful I feel like that makes it sound twee but like you know it's like a deep book about what it means to struggle and how how it feels to have vision for the future. You know? And it's also utopian. Yeah. Right. Sort of. I think it's quite difficult to find feminist utopia. So even if it's just elements. Yeah, no, for sure. I want to read it. Definitely. If you're looking for feminist utopia, definitely read it. I guess this is the family abolition section. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is because uh, next up we have Sophie Lewis, Abolish the Family. A manifesto for care and liberation. A how-to guide to cutting up your dad. That's what I meant to say. I meant to say cutting off your dad. <laughs> I have read it. I didn't notice that part in it, but maybe I just, uh, yeah. I haven't read it, but I know it's in there. <laughs> no, it's, it's a very small book. But yeah, it's very, um, I mean, it talks about Shelby Firestone at one point too, um, and kind of the history of feminist abolitionist, feminist? Family abolitionist talk. Yeah, and I think, again, like, Similar to Firestone is just like quite daring, mm -hmm. which is actually saying what does it mean to radically deconstruct something, reconstruct it, yeah. have a different vision of care, um, and sh and and yeah, not shy away from even like things that might produce a visceral reaction of like mm -hmm. oh this is so different from what we used to, therefore it must be wrong. She's like kind of saying maybe that's good mm -hmm. in terms of reimagining the world. We need those moments. And yeah, she talks about ways to also like see comradeship as a kind of kinship. Yeah, just expanding what kind of words can we use in the way we relate to each other that don't reproduce the social structures mm -hmm. that are patriarchal and capitalist. Uh, so it's quite a nice little book on this topic. Um, cool. Um, the last book to mention is one that I haven't finished yet. Uh, so Vicky can talk more about, but is um, this book, which is very like relevant. And this is um, interviews with radical Palestinian women and it's edited by Shoal Collective. And it's what it says, there's 10 uh, women who've been uh, interviewed and they're, they're from like very different kind of, I guess, positions. Like some are sort of in the diaspora. I guess like the time frame as well of when this book was produced is kind of important just in terms of like the con like contextualizing it, which is that the interviews were happening between 2018 and 2021 and then it was published in 2021. So obviously it doesn't have, you know, it's, it doesn't reference what's happening right now, but it also sort of does in the sense that what's happening right now is what's, what happened before and, you know, it's all part of the same system of apartheid and, and violent oppression. Yeah, I actually also haven't finished this <laughs> oh, book. Oh, I thought you had, okay. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm most of the way through it. Yeah, and like there are s several people interviewed from Gaza in it, and there is something like really quite haunting about reading that right now. Yeah, I agree. In the sense of, yeah, what's happening right now has been happening. Maybe not to this like really yeah, extreme, yeah, like 
short-term degree, but has been happening for decades. Yeah. But that also means that the resistance has been happening for decades, and I think that's a really beautiful account of, of that as well. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe since we're filming this at this moment, we could talk a bit about the ways that people can support Palestine. What would you say? Well, I mean, like, I guess it's just important to keep talking about it right. and look at things like not just the protest, but also uh, various maybe direct ways in which people can disrupt the way that, for example, the UK specifically is like selling arms to Israel. There's sure. arms companies all around the country. All around the country. That yeah. I think Palestine Action yeah. has like a list of and resources and also things like BDS. The Boy Kuzeva Sanction Movement. Um, yeah, and um, like, please, like, actually check what's on the BDS list, okay? It's much better to boycott less things, but do it actually genuinely and consistently, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying you're gonna boycott this massive list of 25,000 <laughs> products <laughs> yeah. and doing that for a week and then stopping. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's to apply pressure. Yes, absolutely. Um, so it's good to check and to, like, make sure you're updated, but just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a long-term thing. Like, obviously, calling for ceasefire is, like, the current focus. But after that, right. there's still yeah. long-term work to be done, so... And I think yeah. it's important to call for a ceasefire, but also to simultaneously call for an end to the occupation. Like, it's not like, oh, if, if Israel just stopped bombing Gaza, it will be fine. I mean, the occupation <sighs> itself is a form of violence. Right. So yeah, it's important to keep that in mind. But yeah, I mean, maybe just, you know, we can put some resources, you know. For sure. Definitely check out Palestine Action. So um, we're going to end by just reading uh, a bit from the interviews with Palestinian women. It's the interview with Lina Nabulsi. So I'll read the question and, and then we will read the answer. Yeah. <laughs> can you tell us a bit about what motivates you to go on struggling? For me, the struggle is the same here in Palestine as for the Black Panthers. We are fighting one evil in this world. The thing that makes me a revolutionary is injustice. We draw inspiration from freedom movements from around the world. Black Lives Matter is something that is close to my heart. The Zapatista movement in Mexico and watching the women rise up in Egypt and in Syria makes me stand stronger. Our struggle has to be global. A struggle against capitalism and against patriarchy. Women need to be in charge. Men have destroyed everything. <laughs> Those that create life are the ones enslaved and are not in power. The only way is for women globally to take over completely in all aspects of life, but not women like Theresa May, Hillary Clinton, or Israeli politician Ayelet Shekhad. Good men should support us as we're fighting together for a free world, but the struggle has to be led by women. What kind of world would you like to see? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked me that question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. For Palestine and all around the world, I would like to see a place where we're allowed to live life. I want a completely different world. I want liberation. A world where respect is returned to humanity in all forms and colours. Where people are allowed to be who they are without living in fear. I don't care what they label this place. I don't care about flags. Freedom without nationality and identity. Not the communist type or the Islamic type. I want a place where everyone of any religion is respected. Animals have to be free as well. I want utopia and I won't accept anything less. It's beautiful. Yeah. To be honest, I don't feel like this whole video and it's like, you, you could just read this and you'd get all of it. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, I think each book is kind of like that. Yeah. Which is why we recommend it. Yeah. Great. Do you have anywhere where you want people to find you? Honestly, don't find me. Vicky wrote a song about Shulamith Firestone. <laughs> okay, maybe do Which find is me. very cool, yeah. Uh, I make music of the like kind of acoustic folk punk type Ooh. among also other types but i'm just gonna plug this one which is under the name v ruins it's v double e ruins and it's also about revolutionary feminism nice cool thank you so much for watching and like i said let us know if you have any recommendations or thoughts about what we talked about and yeah i will talk to you when i next talk to you Yes. Bye. Bye.